joining us in the latest in our series of AHIC Insight webinars. It's been a while since we last met, um, but we are conscious that in addition to the COVID pandemic, there has been um, a bit of a pandemic of webinars and online content. So we wanna ensure that we only bring you content which is quality and is going to be insightful and helpful for your business. So I'm delighted today to be able um, to share with you the HVS um, Investor Insights survey results. <laughs> and um, it's going to be led by Hala Matara Shafani, a lady who needs no introduction in this industry. Um, if you don't know who she is, then uh, you seriously need to uh, check your industry knowledge. She's going to be um, heading up a fabulous panel with Hassan and Anil and Scott. Um, Hassan and Anil are two also very um, prominent hotel owners, Hassan in Saudi and Anil here in the UAE. Um, and then Scott is a legal eagle who will bring his um, perspective to the conversation as well. So um, without further ado, I will let Hala take over. I just will remind you that there's a Q&A button down below that you guys um, can put in your questions. And um, we will try, Hala will, if time allowing, hope to get to all the questions. And we will also be sending you the slides afterwards. So I will now leave you in Hala's capable hands. Enjoy, and I'll see you at the end. Thank you, Jennifer. I mean, you've actually left me speechless, but uh, I'm very happy to be here today and good morning and good afternoon to everyone and for taking the time to join us uh, to the owner and investor, AHIC HVS. Uh, I wouldn't want to call it webinar. This is going to be a friendly chat with uh, three individuals who, uh, I'm not exaggerating, collectively have over 100 years of experience in this sector and specifically in the GCC. They represent also combined more than 30 hotels in this market. And with them, we're going to be taking a deep dive into the HBS owner and investor findings. But more importantly, is to look at what their real and actual challenges are at the moment and how they're looking to reopen, to reassess the market opportunities, what their recovery model would look like, and how are the different stakeholders in the market supporting them and potentially will require to support them. Uh, the focus is gonna be on what they have to tell us. The report itself is available on the HVS uh, website, will be also distributed. So I'm very excited to be talking to the panelists this afternoon across a number of topics. So if I could uh, welcome them individually and just share with you my experience uh, with the uh, each one of them. And um, if I could start with introducing Anil, um, Director of Hospitality at Al Musa. Uh, I think Anil and I met many years ago, I mean, probably 13 years ago when we first met in 2007. And I've always looked up to Anil and I was always very impressed, not just that he's seen the rise and fall, and again, the rise of the sector, but more importantly, in his forward thinking and really highlighting challenges or potentially trends ahead of anyone else. His contribution to AHIC has been great, but also his contribution to this sector is something we can all learn from. Um, we also have with us Scott uh, from BLP. Scott and I have also on a number of occasions discussed uh, hotel owners' contracts and the changes and the challenges and the trends, but definitely while he wears different hats, sometimes on the owner side, but also on the operator side. He's definitely someone who has made win-win deals. And uh, I've very much learned from Scott and enjoyed also looking at how these contracts are changing with time. And perhaps we will be talking further as post-COVID, how these contracts may even be uh, impacted further. And last but not least, I'm very pleased to be able to bring into this discussion from KSA, Hassan Adhab. Hassan, uh, the uh, CEO of Hospitality for Dur. Uh, Dur, who have in 2019 also expanded and acquired a large stake into Shada, which is a homegrown brand. They have around 20 hotels uh, owned, managed, operated in the pipeline. They have their own brand, but they also have uh, hotels under the management agreements with Marriott, IHD, and Hilton. I'm very pleased again, and we're gonna go straight now to looking at what are the areas that we're going to be exploring with the panelists uh, over the next 45 minutes. If we could uh, look, at, yeah, we've got the slide there. So we would like to start off by looking at the actual operational challenges, 
and the what I call the reopenness readiness. Are we ready to reopen? Will we reopen? And if we're open, how are we surviving? We will move on also to look at the government support. Some has been already put forward, but do we need more? What is the operator and owner relationships at the moment? Uh, how can we improve it? And uh, uh, you know, as we're discussing this, definitely, what is the legality that will govern uh, these discussions and the future dealings? And hopefully we will also be able to close up with recovery, development opportunities, and where do we see the future? So um, I'm just gonna set the stage with a couple of the graphs that uh, from the HVS um, hotel and order survey, the sample is uh, roughly 206 branded hotels across the region and the region being specifically the GCC, the equivalent of 70,000 uh, uh, room keys. And, uh, you know, I mean, they're quite telling. Uh, at the moment we have 39% uh, that are partially operational. What does that mean? Is it with reduced room count because of the current 30% uh, uh, capacity? Definitely we know meeting space and the spa have been closed down permanently and no, no signs of reopening anytime soon. But more importantly, there is roughly 30% of these hotels that have been totally closed down and the challenges there are we gonna be able to reopen. And the ones that are only operational is 7%, which is quite a, a, a small number in the bigger scheme of things. Uh, some of these hotels, and I know um, definitely Hassan, some of their properties, they have been, been transformed into quarantine facilities. And we will also try to understand more what, you know, was that a business that was really supportive to the sector? Um, but more importantly, I think, what does that tell us in terms of liabilities? And this is what I want to hear from the panelists is, if 75% of hotel owners told us that they will only be able to meet their liabilities, and that relates definitely to staffing and the costs associated in running the day-to-day, -day, whether closed or open, 75% can only meet it up to six months. What are the implications by year end? And what is gonna be required for the future recovery? Uh, to conclude on the next slide with an additional uh, two graphs, to, when looking at, again, from an, from an owner or investor side, you know, the hotel values, we've always been very keen to ensure that the operating model will result in an improvement and appreciation of the real estate asset. And as hotels are income producing asset, their values are defined by the income potential and EBITDA. So 39% of the respondents believe that it will take at least 18 months for EBITDA to return to normal. And an additional 39%, they're, they're forecasted anywhere between 12 to 18 months. So combined, 80% of the respondents, they realize this is going to be long. It's going to be at least 12 to 18 months. And at the moment, as we speak, hotel values are likely sitting somewhere between 20 and 30% lower than end of 2019. Um, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to um, dwell on 2019, but we were already seeing a decline in values in 2019 of close to 25%. So there are serious issues here. And, you know, by acknowledging them, we can solve them. So with that, I'm just going to pause here and go all the way to you, Hassan, in, in Riyadh, I'm assuming, and bring you into this conversation so we can start looking at how, how does that relate to the 20 odd hotels in your portfolio today? What were the challenges? Where are the opportunities? And how are you looking to reopening uh, in the near future? Thank you very much, Hala, for hosting me uh, for this very important panel. Uh, definitely, we represent uh, Dur Hospitality. Uh, just for the clarity, I'm the president of Hotel Operation, uh, not the CEO. Our CEO is Sultan al uh, Hopefully, he's with us also on this panel. Uh, it's a very important matter for all of us. Uh, speaking about our portfolio, yes, we do have we own hotels. We operate hotels on behalf of other owners, and we have our own brand. And then we do franchise also with international operators. So we have the, all the panels and all the experiences for this one. Having said that, and going back to the challenges, I think if we go before the pandemic by one second, I think we all had, particularly in Saudi Arabia, but I believe it's all GCC areas, we had an extraordinary uh, quarter four for 2019. 
And the beginning of 2020 was very, very promising. I would say, unfortunately, this pandemic came out of the blue and end of March, the situation became really dark on all of us. And definitely from here, we started our challenges. Uh, from full house to zero revenue. So I think this is one element which we need to deal with. Uh, from, I would say, a full employment and how you're going to deal with, the, with, with all your employees. And obviously, our continuous running costs, which will become a challenge. Uh, how we recovered this? I think we had to shut down certain hotels in Mecca, not just because of us, because Mecca is completely locked down. Uh, we had empty hotels here in Riyadh that very likely have been helped by the business coming back from the government by for the quarantine areas. So some of our hotels have been selected, and then we regained business completely right away. And from this angle, I think we managed to continue protecting the employment LM, uh, part of it. Uh, the uh, other elements is because of the closure of certain hotels, I think... We are no different from the others. We all went into a very serious contingency plan to limit the fat. So we negotiated with suppliers to reduce costs. We froze certain agreements. We had to really uh, force certain vacation and annual leave for our people. Uh, have, having said that, it's a normal measure which has been supported by everybody. Kept us cruising and trying surviving this particular period, which I call it the remainder of the quarter one and until the basically until now the end of quarter two so this is what we have done uh, from a business perspective i think the the world has mentioned that the pandemic will last a couple of three months then the rebounds or return or post pandemic will become uh, more available and apparent but my point of view here, we are coming to the end of June. And end of June, I don't think everybody sees the, the light at the end of the tunnel from a pandemic point of view. However, I think most of countries, companies, governments really looked into, okay, so what is after? The life needs to go back to normal so you can see the ease on the lockdown and the return to the economy uh, progressively from opening the shops, malls. Uh, you know, we, we definitely a serious restriction on hygiene. And this is where I call it, we are all adjusting now to the new norms. And the new norm is to be hyper high hygiene focused, but on the same time also trying to search for uh, new opportunities. And the new opportunities from my point of view is we are now in the pos position of studying the new behavior for the corporation, okay, how the corporate business will react. We've all spent basically three months working from home and we adjusted to the working from home, teleconferencing like this one in particular. We spent more time at home or family, you can call it this way. Uh, the most important one is social distancing and how we behave with the others. So we cannot just take this, whatever happened to us in isolation. This will reflect also on our be business behavior for the coming period. And having said that, all corporation may think of reducing office rent, okay, or space for, for their offices. Uh, maybe they may offer to their employees certain part time to work from home because everybody looks enjoying it. Our experience in our company, I tell you, the productivity during this period was extremely phenomenal. Uh, everybody was fully engaged in, in, in within our team. I think everybody was even giving more. The case, I can call it almost the 24-7 available. Also, we are in the industry. I mentioned earlier, we had some hotels closed, some hotels not closed. Even for the closed hotels, we have our employees in the compounds. So we need to look, we have looked after them. We look after their safety, their hygiene. Uh, so, so we're really busy during this period and the entire team fully engaged and amazed of it. And if they are listening to me, I say a big thank you to all of them on this one. So uh, this is how it, we spent the period, but then adjusting to the new norm. There is one unknown element also for all of us, which is how the airline will react. We, see, we hear a lot of announcement on the, the airline coming back, new destination opening up, and a lot of measures have been taken into making the very safe uh, by going to the airport a couple of hours before, etc. and the process. But 
nobody reflected on the airfare. And this is a major element on if the airfare is double or triple, this also will reduce the travel pattern where we at the end, we are the recipient from a room's point of view, we, we, this will impact on the number of guests arrival, et cetera. Another element which we need, we, it's in the unknown and we need to work on it, is the future of these big mega conferences. We have seen, you know, the world has not stopped working and all the big conferences, okay, whether it's governmental or uh, different section and others have been done uh, virtually. So would this continue? And if this continue, there is a segment of mice which need to be completely relooked at from A to Z point. So these are the challenges, if we cannot just summarize and, and give the word to Anil to add on, but it, these are the kind of challenges which we have faced, we try to overcome, and we continue working on. Thank you, Hassan. I mean, you've definitely raised a couple of points that I would like to follow up with some questions, but uh, I'd like to hear from Anil with regards to the current operation challenges and their readiness for reopening and then we can drill further into some of the points that you mentioned relating to travel, but also to the cost, cost of reopening. Um, so Anil, uh, if I could come back locally here to the UAE, um, would you mind telling us more about the current status of your hotels? What has been the implications and what, how are you looking at recovery? I mean, we also, we have similar challenges here in terms of visibility for airport and tourism and arrivals anytime soon. So I'll leave it with you to, to talk us through it. Well, uh, thank you all. Um, it's nice to, you know, uh, share my views on this very difficult subject, actually. The elephant in the room here is, of course, God, nature, whatever you want to call it, you know, who's really driving the agenda, frankly. Um, and we are just trying to be as reactive or proactive as we can be. Um, the UAE, actually, when you think about it, um, has, is handling it quite well. You know, uh, uh, The number of cases in the last week or so have dramatically dropped. There's intensive testing going on. They have the advantage of a very small population base. A uh, very disciplined population base in a way. Um, you know, initially there were some challenges, but uh, the government quickly locked down certain local areas and then got it under control. So I think the UAE, in terms of its own internal challenges of the disease, will be ready. And they've already started. Op they've almost opened up everything now, um, like barring the flights, which they are talking about. Uh, you know, certain restrictive ways of moving around. Um, but that's literally changing by the day also. Um, but having said that, um, in our industry, it's uh, one thing, of course, to get yourself safe, your environment safe, uh, which will, of course, attract visitors from wherever. But uh, what is happening to the rest of the world from where the visitors are going to come, that's a different question. So, uh, you know, it's going to be, it, it, you know, travel is, is like that. I mean, we can't just, uh, our industry with the inventory we have in the UAE, uh, with the population we have, the population mix, we obviously cannot generate domestic business enough to fill our England 50 offices, uh, rooms, room bays, apartments, etc. So we are very dependent on uh, incoming. Uh, mm -hmm. And that is the unknown right now. Um, what have been the challenges in the last three months and the next three months till the open, our opening, et cetera? I think uh, this is something nobody was prepared. Let's be very honest. Um, it is a, a level of uh, uh, problem that neither even management, forget management agreements, they cannot even address these kind of issues. Um, um, but um, I would say that the, both the operator and owner from day one had one primary objective. And that was, as soon as they started realizing at the end of the one week, that this is here to stay and will stay for a while, they didn't know how much whether it would be a month, two or three, but it certainly started becoming very soon six months and may go beyond. 
I think the reaction should have been um, a little different to what I you know, have felt. Um, their objective should have been, okay, let's try and get the bleeding to stop ASAP. This was very important to get the bleeding to stop. Um, there was going to be some bleeding for sure. Um, were they geared with the tools to do that? No. And I don't blame anyone because something like this is completely unforeseen. Did they move with the speed which, you know, they, whether they had the skill set to do it? I honestly don't know because these are things which then have to be handled at their head offices so that it's spelt out to all their uh, thousands of hotels all over the world. Um, I mean, the first thing I said to everyone was, you know, my accounting background, a finance background, uh, you know, I'm familiar with uh, things like zero based, etc., which is a, a fundamental principle that then starts coming into play. And you say to yourself, let's quickly draw up a template and send it across to everyone and say, hey, gentlemen, we have to get to zero based ASAP. Here is a template and zero base will literally mean you go to a lot of detail, examine each and every cost as if it starts from zero and then build it up. But because of the uncertainty also of this problem, we had to have a lot of various uh, permutations and combinations built into that as a as sensitivity analysis. So there could be almost half a dozen of them that if this happens, this is what you will do. If that happens, this is what you will do, kind of scenarios. Did the operators get to that as rapidly as you would have liked them? No, not really. Um, but in due credit to them, um, they certainly handle, at least the operators that we deal with, um, handled um, their, uh, you know, the relationship with owners very proactively, communication, their own charges, their own fees, their whatever, you know, they've handled that, you know, pretty actively. Um, so, uh, but, you know, that is, a, that is a relatively smaller part of the story. The bigger story is the other big cost that, you know, typically payroll, for example. We have special challenges in our region. Um, workers are 95% or more perhaps coming from abroad. You, if you get uh, to terminate them, then it's a big job of getting them back, recruitment costs, additional, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, apart from that, uh, the big spanner in the works, you cannot even send them back because the flights are canceled. So you have to continue bearing the costs and that's what's happening right now. We are continuing to bear the costs of even people we may have terminated, at least in terms of their lodging, their food, et cetera. That's humanity. That's something basic we need to do. Uh, even their medical needs, they have to be taken care of. So this is the stage at which we are right now. Moving on to the next stage that's going to come, and it's already, I think, green shoots have started appearing. The reopening or uh, some of the our properties which are already open. Uh, how do you scale them up, back or up? Again, here I would say the principle, we should stay with the principle that I enunciated right at the beginning. Stay as close as possible to break even. You cannot uh, right, right now be too fussed with brand standards. I must have so many staff to so many rooms and all that. I mean, let's just hold that for a while. Guests will also have to be obviously, you know, uh, they've been spoiled in the past, but you know, this is reality right now. The only thing you will not, the only thing you will not compromise is life and safety. Sure, absolutely, uh, because without that, nobody will come to you. So there may be some additional things there that you take care of. But try and do the ramp up to match the revenues as they come in. I keep telling this to all people. And I hope uh, somebody is listening out there. Thank you, Anil. Uh, again, I would like to spend a little bit more time talking about this relationship uh, with the operator, but also the government support that you will be needing. But at this stage, how many of your hotels have actually closed down? As we speak today um, yeah so I would say pure pure close down 
uh, three or four of the 12 or so, okay? Okay. Uh, no, maybe, maybe five, maybe five with our hotel apartments, etc. cetera. Um, but there's parts of them have already started reopening, okay? So okay. FNB outlets have started opening because there's an F&B, we feeling a demand has started. Um, and um, one of them, of course, we are, by the way, two of our properties are in Oman also. And one of them had the misfortune of being in the way of the cyclone we had recently. And so mm. there was a double whammy, but you know, that's nature again, asserting its uh, powers. Um, so, you know, but there are others, some of them were mixed use. So we had long-term guesting with them. So they stayed partially open. Um, we are fortunate that a lot of our properties are resorts uh, or right close to the water and uh, that i think will help us as we reopen because uh, you know one of the points you mentioned earlier and which you have touched upon you know the challenges uh, that what will be the business model of traveling in the future the way i look at it business travel i think will diminish vis-a-vis -vis, uh, as a percentage of total travel uh, leisure will come back faster. Uh, as far as my schools, my view is the bigger events, you know, sometimes you cannot do, you know, you cannot get a lot of some of the bigger events on, on the net and all that. So there is a lot of one-to-one -one in those and those will probably continue, but the smaller mice event may suffer, but certainly business travel, you know, will, you know, will, I believe for a while will, uh, you know, reduce. So, Properties which are on resorts or on the beach, etc., I think will have an advantage from that perspective. Yeah, and I think we're all, uh, you know, we're all in with agreement with what you just said, uh, Anil. Uh, I mean, specifically in the UAE, uh, there are many resort properties that were running with 100% occupancy on account of some people that decided to self self quarantine. I mean, these uh, these these are the lucky ones, and they are the exceptions. But I would like now to specifically ask you as owners and bring Scott into this conversation as well. Who makes the decision to close down and who will make the decision to reopen? I mean, obviously, operators may want their properties to be open, but that will also have cost implications. So the question here, how is that decision making process governed? And uh, are you looking to actually reopen all your properties and anytime soon? Okay, so if I may jump in there before Scott gives us his legal standpoint. The good news here is that we did not need lawyers. I'm sorry to say that, Scott, but the owners and operators, at least the operators we dealt with, we realized that something like this, if we started getting arguments about what the agreement is, what is the nature of this event, what does the management agreement say in this respect, we would have you know, had a real problem on our hands. We came to very amenable understandings, you know, absolutely very clear. We said, let's revise the budget. Okay, let's see, look at the budget again. Uh, whether we formally call it a budget, we don't know because literally I would call it more forecast actually because it was changing almost every second week. Okay, so we would, at least then both parties are aware what is the game plan going on here. There was much more increased interaction between the asset manager of the owner and the operator. Uh, I don't think, um, you know, we really got into the legalities part of it. And as far as it seems right now, you know, there doesn't seem to be any challenges. But yes, if, um, you know, if you read through strictly through the agreements and Scott will tell us more about that. Um, there are so many aspects about uh, the, the agreement which uh, could be worrisome for some owners. I think the operators themselves have been very, uh, in our case, certainly have been proactive, like suspending the FFNE, suspending some of their other charges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, being very clear about certain things. There will be no audit requirement. You don't need to file this, that. You need, you know, all, you know, all those sort of things. They were proactive in that. So, you know, these are the important things that they were handling. And that's good. You know, this is where we need to be in the same boat. Really. Absolutely. Scott, uh, have you had, a, a, you know, any requests so far to come in with, to assist with these uh, decision making and especially in light of those 
hotel owners that for all the good reasons perhaps are unable to open anytime soon. Uh, can you share with us a little bit more about uh, management agreements and how they're dealing with these issues? Well, fortunately, I haven't. Um, I think um, one reason here is the operator and the owners are pretty much aligned in this uh, pandemic that uh, the owner wants to save costs in closing early or not reopening. And the operator, if you're not having any turnover, there's not much reason to open in the first place. So there's a certain amount of alignment. Now, if there wasn't, and there was a dispute, I mean, generally, you have to look at the contract, but generally, the management contracts leave the decision to initially open the hotel, as well as to close or close or reopen after say, let's say a damage and destruction, that's an operator decision because they have been granted the authority to make decisions in the operation of the hotel. Now, I think if an owner wanted to challenge that, they would probably be in breach of the contract, but they could do it because the operator is a contracted guest uh, in under common law, usually treated as an agent of the owner. And he can have contractual damages, but he can't keep his position in the hotel. So if the owner wanted to push it, he could, but they might have contractual damages. But the, I, I haven't seen this an issue uh, because, as I said, both parties are aligned. Uh, an operator, based on the typical model of, uh, you know, a fee based on revenues and GOP, isn't making any money if there's no turnover. Scott, so on that point, I think, uh, okay, so this is the last couple of months and I realize that, you know, we are all in the same boat and definitely we've seen a lot of efforts from the operators in trying to take away some of the burdens on owners and it's all been done in very positive and good intentions. Uh, specifically today, I mean, there are operators have uh, spend time really rolling out the new brand standards that relate to this pandemic, but also the health and safety regulations. And I'm sure Anil and Hassan will agree there's a cost implication to that. And the challenge is, do we follow through the government regulations and the government have actually also been imposing and following up on these precautionary measure? And how does the brand standards requirement ties into this and the funding? Where do you see this is all impacting the relationship between the owner and uh, the operator. Well, the, the contract always requires, well, both parties are required to comply with the applicable laws of the operating country. So that's, that's not for debate. Uh, typically your management contracts require that the owner fund any brand standard requirements and particularly things that are fire, life, safety, or applicable law. Um, this is going to be an additional cost. And uh, again, I see a certain amount of alignment because to entice people back to the hotel, a big concern is going to be health and safety. And if you don't adopt some of these brand standards of the brand, you're, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. Um, and arguably that the operator should be establishing very, very clear health, health and safety guidelines to market these hotels and get them open again. So again, I see a certain amount of alignment, but there's no question that um, the cost of running a property going forward is going to be higher. And then we have to look at compliance with brand standards on a broader sense. Um, things, uh, some things make sense. If you have, you need high speed Wi-Fi, yes, or people won't come to the hotel. But what if it's an upgrade in your side of the bed telephone to, uh, a, I don't know, a digital thing? Do you really need that? Or can, is that something to be deferred? And I, I can see um, owners pushing back on those things, even though technically, typically the uh, contract says you must comply with brand standards, but Hopefully, there'll be some pragmatism on both sides there. Sure. 
So Hassan and Anil, can I ask your views around this and brand standards that will be imposed by the operator, but also with regards to the government uh, uh, regulations concerning health and safety? Okay, Hassan, you first. Hassan, you need to unmute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I thought Nabil is going to do it from his end, so no problem. Uh, I think I'm fully aligned with what uh, Scott mentioned here. Uh, I think whatever, first of all, we do need to look to where the customer's, you know, attention. I mentioned earlier that the new customer behavior will dictate basically every move in this industry going forward. And uh, take it on all of us. We will not go to a place where we have even 1% doubt that it is not really clean from COVID-19 and, and alike. So I think all the operators, and we, have, we, we deal with all international operators in addition to our own brand. And we've been working very hard like everyone else on creating the, I would say, the trust for our uh, future customers coming back. Uh, so it, it, it is indeed has a new cost for our operations. We need to find out where we mitigate it, you know, with, with other things. I think the, the best thing which we'll be doing in the, in the coming period, sitting down with the international operator and say, okay, we have this new cost imposed on all of us, whether it is, uh, uh, I would say, uh, imposed by government, okay, uh, and what is complemented by the operator if, if there is any addition to that. And that particular cost needs to be mitigated and offset against something else, which is, as Scott mentioned, maybe less essential to the guest. Today, the guests look for uh, hyper hygiene, okay, and really high speed internet. And then maybe he would relinquish many other stuff which the operator was imposing on it. I believe that uh, an open discussion will take place or should take place with the international operator to sign that the cost of the room, uh, this is how it is, and we should not eat on the profitability of the room. We know that there are uh, uh, competition will remain in the marketplace from an ADR, so you cannot top it up to your ADR. So therefore, I think we need to absorb this in a way or another. So this is my, my opinion on that particular new brand standard. Now, that's it. It's interesting you speak about the ADR, Hassan, and that's one thing I wanted to talk about also earlier on when you mentioned about the cost of airfare. It's, it's tricky because, uh, I mean, we are also hoping that operators will not put up the price because of the price sensitivity as well of these travelers. I mean, we'd have less people traveling and they cannot afford to travel as much as they were able to afford, which really, you know, leaves the owner with very little there to be able to fund and comply with these new regulations, but also to eventually be able to what Anil said earlier on. How do we break even? I mean, what's going to be that magic formula, if at all, and how soon? Uh, Anil, did you want to add anything with regards to uh, the uh, imposing brand standards and whether this is something that the owner is able to pick up on in terms of funding it? Yeah, well, the brand standards, I think Scott has said it. I mean, you know, um, I think um, till we all break even, um, it's no owner is going to be happy on spending on FFNE and and stuff like that. I mean, let's face it, you know, it's going to be a drip feed system till we start getting into the black, et cetera. Et cetera. I'm very clear about that. And I'm, I'm really hoping that operators are going to be aligned to that. As far as um, funding, et cetera, goes, um, well, I, you know, I've read the reports and uh, of the central bank in the UAE being very supportive uh, on that. And they had instructed all the commercial banks to support industry, et cetera, including hospitality. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's not easy. It's not, a, it's not a pot that you can draw on unlimitedly. Um, so uh, you really need to get your own house in order to, yes, there will be some support and it will be up to a certain period. They've also waived certain fees, this, that, whatever. Um, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, you'll have to manage your cash flow, uh, you know, yourself. Uh, I think that's important. 
as far as what I would, I think I was just thinking about this. Um, what can the government do to help us? Um, as I mentioned right at the beginning, the market size in each one of our countries, certainly UAE, uh, internal travel is relatively small. If there was a way and provided the COVID handling situation is similar in all the GCC, if the travel between the GCC then can be relaxed to a point where you just can get on a plane, show your resident visa wherever you land and you're there. I mean, you know, something so simple, provided of course the health side, they're all happy about it, that, you know, that's taken care of. I mean, that will create a demand which we have not seen in the past, uh, you know, um, till we start looking at all the other parts of the world where it may be a little more complicated than our own home ground. <clears throat> Yeah, and I totally agree. And I think you're talking about this travel corridor that, you know, when we talk about local and domestic tourism, I mean, you said that earlier on, Anil, I mean, the UAE will not necessarily benefit from domestic tourism, whereas, uh, you know, KSA will definitely benefit from domestic tourism. And I would also like to hear from Hassan specifically as it relates to the religious tourism sector in, in particular. But this morning, I read real quickly through the recent announcement that the UAE government uh, has done with regards to travel in and out of the country and classifying countries by Group A, Group B, and Group C. Group C being you can't travel there, full stop. But even in the Group A, I was surprised to see that not all the GCC countries have been listed. So again, this is going to be dependent how soon. I, I mean, we, we all know this is changing by the day and by the week. So they, this might change next week. But at, again, as we speak today, we cannot necessarily plan recovery from the nearer segments or from within a shorter travel radius than, than what we would be hoping for. But that takes us nicely into discussing really the government support because obviously we recognize and we've done that very early on, uh, I think now three months ago when we look at the different government initiatives across the GCC with the K KSA and UAE definitely being much more behind supporting and providing uh, stimulus packages to support the sector. Initially, that was rolled out for a three-month period, I think. We have been talking about the need for support to be extended much longer. My personal view, as I said earlier on, would be 12 to 18 months. But um, Hassan, I, you know, with our discussion, I understand, and I was also listening to the Minister of Tourism yesterday, talking about how much the, the, you know, the, the support that they have provided and continue to provide. Has this support been helpful? And what else do you think, in what form can they help you as owners in order to sustain until we start seeing some recovery, which again will probably be somewhere next year? And if we could also address the religious tourism and whether this is something that, uh, my guess is it's not happening in July, but you can definitely tell us more about uh, the Hajj period. Uh, absolutely, Helen. Um, I'm really amazed by the, from day one, how the Saudi government reacted to this pandemic. Uh, they have launched numerous support to almost everybody, and particularly the private sector. This has uh, made a complete turnaround, and from our conversation, you and me before, yes, it is material and on the ground as we speak. I think the first one is protection for, protection for employment. Uh, there, is, there was an amazing program which where government really took at their charge almost 60% of all Saudi's employees to avoid them, avoid corporations and companies to lay them off and by a program called SANIT and have devoted for it and it's already in action. Major companies who wanted to benefit from this have already applied and it is ongoing. It's period for three months and maybe there is a talk for extension for it as we speak. Another program for the expats sitting at home, okay, they created the program called Ajir. So, which means if I have a certain potential or capacity of doing it, instead of staying at home, some other companies, they may need my expertise and my company can lend me or put my name into the Ajir program and I can go and assist the others. So this to keep us active and very proactive for this one. Uh, there are many other uh, programs, okay, other than the employment, which has been discussed or uh, implemented here. It's from a monetary point of view, okay, actually, they eased on loan, they eased on interest, 
they eased on the custom duties. And most importantly, from us as the operator, they eased on the utility bills, 30% reduction on the utility bills. And we've seen it on the bill itself. So these are really amazing, I would say, programs coming in. You mentioned earlier the announcement of His Excellency the Minister of Tourism last night. Again, this is, shows that we've been proactive and there is an extremely, I would say, good potential for people after the lockdown, they want to they wanna go out a little bit. So instead of going out randomly everywhere, there are programs encouraging, I would say, uh, citizens in Saudi Arabia, whether they are expat or locals, okay, to go and follow and discover Saudi Arabia. I would just want to remind, before the pandemic, Saudi Arabia was discovering or unlocking different treasure and historical sites. Now, we've been talking about it for the last year, I would say. Now it is the right time for, for at least the citizen to go and visit. And as everybody would like to go on vacation, so there are too many staycations program have been, I would say, listed and programmed. All the uh, local DMCs have been involved with the support of ministries of putting programs and encouraging people as soon as the lockdown is completely open, which is as of next Sunday, uh, people, whoever is planning to go for an even short or long time term break, they can benefit from it. Uh, back to the, uh, I would say, the religious tourism. Uh, yeah, we are coming to the Hajj season. There is no clarity on the Hajj season. Also, government is taking an extreme precautions to really make uh, any visit to the Holy Mosque are completely safe uh, and it's happening and it's coming almost every day. Safety measures are implemented and tested as we speak. Uh, not yet announced about opening Hajj completely or partially. So this is something as we, well, something we're waiting for it. Uh, assume, putting this aside, but there is a strong preparation for the Umrah season. Uh, just to give the audience about the season in Saudi Arabia, particularly the holy cities, you, you speak about the Amra season, which starts from Wahid Muharram, okay, which is beginning of October, uh, and it will end by okay, the, the just be after Ramadan, okay, 15th of Shawwal, which is like nowadays. Uh, so, and then afterward, you have the Hajj season, which you go for the real pilgrim. So uh, the, the preparation for the Amra season is really up to speed. Uh, I, think, I think we will recover on the, on the Amra season by the back end of the of quarter 2020. Uh, so this is what, uh, what, is, what is happening. Uh, for Hajj, we will know. We will wait and see situation. We won't expect Hajj to come exactly to the same strength like prior years. But if it opens, it will definitely make a difference for us. And if it doesn't, okay, we are also prepared for it and be ready for the uh, Umbra seasons. Great, I thank you, Hassan. It, it definitely does. I'm just going to ask Anil uh, to talk uh, about the, you know, the government, have they been helpful? I can see a lot of questions coming through, so I really want to try in the last 10 minutes to take the, the questions that have been asked. But some of these questions, again, relate to the government support. So as owners, uh, Anil, have you... Would you describe these as being tangible? I mean, there were a number of uh, um, waivers and incentives here in the UAE. How did you benefit as an owner? And there was a question specifically that relates to the refinancing or waivers from the banks. Have you had any experience there? Well, uh, you know, uh, you, it depends on each owner's situation, of course, you know, whether they need that uh, uh, to go approach a bank, etc., for that particular subject. But from what I hear, and certainly in the market, having talked to a few friends, etc. Yes, the government has shown that flexibility. Um, what I hear is that they have, uh, in their cases, uh, agreed to uh, defer the uh, principal payments of this year uh, for, you know, to be carried forward till at least the end of the year. And then, you know, obviously at the end of the year, you have to really go back again and look at it again. And perhaps they were asked to, uh, you know, keep servicing the interest so that, you know, there is a, a mutual arrangement there. This is what I hear from people. Um, but, you know, some peop for some people, it's, uh, um, it's not just about the refinancing. It's they're looking even beyond that. 
as uh, you mentioned in your study, 75% of owners are saying they can only last up to six months. Uh, you know, frankly, um, you have to be a very, very smart owner, operator, to be able to get to break even and open at the end of even six months, right? Now, this is three months have already gone. Right. So you, you know, if you think that that's going to go into 18 months and 24 months, and then you expect, you know, banks to not have any prepayments for the next two years, etc., then I suggest that you start looking at even other options, you know, uh, maybe. Uh, yeah. Definitely, so yeah. Depends on individual to individual, your property, mm -hmm. how focused you are in that in this industry, etc. Scott, uh, if I could come to you with the questions regarding the, you know, obviously we're going to have owners talking to banks, owners talking to operators, owners having to let people go. This is reality. What are the sticky points? What are the few things that you want to leave with us and with the attendees? Let me, if, if the lawyer can speak a little on the geopolitics, I mean, as Anil pointed out, the, the government assistance so far, these have been items to stop the bleeding. What we need now is items to create demand. Obviously, one is health and safety, making sure that guests uh, are comfortable coming here. Um, maybe it's about time some of these petty differences among the GCC countries between Sunni, Shi'i, Qatar, Saudi, UAE, Iran, get over it and, uh, you know, it's, it's essential that you, we start opening up travel, um, health uh, considerations aside, but getting over some of these self-inflicted wounds of the region. The other issue is in this, in this region, um, you know, unlike the UK, Germany, France, where 70, 80, 90% of tourism is domestically driven, I think it's just the opposite here, that about 20, 80% is long haul travel driven. How do you make that affordable? Maybe that's one of the government areas that it was what the Ryanair EasyJet model was. They were arguing that at one point in time, you won't pay for our airfares because governments and businesses in the, in the destination country will pay us to bring people here. Maybe that's another thing we need to visit. Um, on, on the banking and uh, employment, yes. Uh, I mean, this is not a very strong uh, labor law country, regions. Um, and I think uh, for the most part so far, both owners and operators uh, have, with exceptions, done the right thing with uh, you know, struggling people who have no place, they have no funds and no place to go. Not even they can't go home if you do terminate them. And the rules I think that the government's put in place requiring housing are, are good, not just, uh, they may cost money, but uh, if you don't do that, you won't have future employees when things go back to uh, better. On the financing side, yes, you better look at your, um, obviously your, your covenants and your loans uh, are, are probably out of whack, your loan to values, uh, uh, debt service coverage, and you're gonna to have to talk with the uh, banks on that. But uh, so many people in this situation, there's the old adage, you owe the bank a hundred dollars, so you have a problem, you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank has a problem. And that's kind of the situation we're in today. The banks have all of their customers with big problems. So there is room for negotiation there. Right, so we are gonna have to start concluding here and I'm looking at the questions. There's one in particular I wanna pick uh, and uh, perhaps I will comment on it and then also ask you Anil and Hassan to Comment. What does the panel believe will happen to room rates? Will they rise? Should they lower the prices or stay the same? And then there was another question that ties into ADR as well with the upcoming supply that will slow down dramatically. So I would want to start off by saying, you know, we've seen uh, the highs and lows and we, you know, as much as we'd like to think that by reducing the rate, you're going to get people like, you know, our, also our traveler and guest uh, uh, confidence survey suggested that it's all about the confidence. It has nothing to do with whether you have a good rate. It's whether people are comfortable to travel and people are comfortable to, to stay. My view is uh, by reducing the rate is not going to help owners necessarily build the occupancy, but also by increasing aggressively the rate will, will impact 
uh, demand because there are a lot of people that would have lost their jobs and they have lost their income and potentially there's this price elasticity there. Anil, what are your views specifically on rate strategy and then Hassan? Um, you know, in this business, and we know this from the past also, um, when the occupancy falls beyond a point, right now it's fallen through the floor, so there is no point left. Um, the rates will stay challenged for some time, okay? And um, the way I, I mean, you know, it's up to operators to decide where they will finally position their various brands, etc. cetera. Um, but I suspect the gap between their various brands is going to be absolutely minimal for quite some time to come. I mean, that's reality. Um, they, the idea would be, everyone's going to work to how do I get to break even ASAP? That's the key here. Everybody wants the bleeding to stop, okay? So if in the UAE you have a very large inventory, um, you are bound to have rate pressures till that inventory gets somewhere into the 60s, at least, okay? The moment you start getting into the 60s, perhaps, you know, or maybe a little earlier, you might start achieving break-even, then you start becoming tightening your fists a bit. I mean, this is typical business. There is no nuclear physics about it. Um, we have seen some absolutely crazy things in the last 30 days itself, and some hotels came up with some rates, which I almost hit my head, and I said, oh, my goodness me. <laughs> but uh, that was all temporary, I guess. You know, right. uh, Some people pressed the panic button too soon. Right. The advantage will again, location, location will still come into play and uh, the better properties will uh, finally come out of it faster than the others. And, you know, we are all cool. hoping so. Hassan, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, I just want to say one thing on the, sorry, on the prices. Um, I think my, my, my comments here are more a message rather than an opinion on it. I think price war is not helpful at all, okay? This is where we're not in a high demand area to start really going into a price war or trying to gain market share. Uh, for, for KSA, the, the, the average win rate is really reasonable. We are not sky high to say we can take a hit of 5, 10, 20% on it, with the exception of Jeddah, which is you know, like the highest ADR in, in, in the world. But, I would say for the rest of KSA, there is no room to, to play around with the ADR. And as was mentioned earlier, we need to break even in the test. So it will not come on the back of the ADR. More interestingly, I think, is we are now relying purely on rooms revenue. Okay, the restaurant revenue is almost is nil anymore. So you, you, you do not have any other backup or other ancillary uh, revenue to come and back up your ADR or your rooms revenue if you play with your ADR. So it is not an opinion, it's really a message. Do not play with your ADR at the end of the day. Just grab your market share without really harming the ADR average in the country. Thank you. Uh, Scott, I would just want to conclude with the last question uh, for you. Uh, is there indication that government will pass legislation requirement minimum hygiene standards, in your opinion? Uh, I, I hope so. I think this is a marketing uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, Singapore has just passed their own um, hotel cleanliness standards, and it's a, they come in and do certain things, and they give us put a stamp, a good housekeeping stamp on the hotel. I think that makes sense. Obviously, that not, must be uh, coordinated between the owners, the operators, and in having good science and planning. But, you know, the, this country, as Anil pointed out, this has probably one, been one of the better places to be stuck in a pandemic. Uh, I'm much happier here than in the uh, great Anglo-Saxon countries insofar as managing the pandemic. And I, when this government does things, it, it tends to do it right and get professionals to do it. So yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. I know- And I've also heard- 
Yeah, just to add to this, I've also heard that here in the UAE, there are, there are some initiatives and definitely Iraq, uh, TDA Iraqi was talking to me about uh, some of their properties actually getting a stamp. So this may become actually a requirement and then potentially they will be passing the law. Um, I, we're just at the one o'clock mark and I'm very conscious that people have been already with us for the last one hour. Unfortunately, we won't be able to touch on the future opportunities, although there are plenty. And, but hopefully we can come back together and have a discussion around uh, uh, what, where the opportunities are and how the recovery is looking like in the next couple of uh, months. But I would like to thank all of you uh, for taking the time for being with us uh, this afternoon. And I will wish you a good weekend and uh, stay safe and stay connected. Thank you. Thank you Thank so much, you. Hala, Anil, Scott, Hassan. I think that was a very frank and informative discussion that everyone would have gained a lot of insight from. Unfortunately, there seems to be a lot of pain and um, less on the gain side, but we'll get there. As everyone identified, the, the situation is evolving constantly and um, things are changing day by day. So um, we at AHIC will continue to keep bringing people together and keeping you informed. We will have some um, exciting announcements in the coming weeks regarding our plans for AHIC and also be reaching out to the AHIC delegates um, to inform them about what the future holds. Now, I would also um, recommend that you all check out uh, griff.com slash marketplace. On the 24th, we're hosting an event there that has a really informative uh, round table with um, hotel F&B industry experts. I know that's a key discussion at the moment and um, something that hotel owners and operators are really looking towards as people try and um, activate their F&B to capture some of the domestic dollar. So everyone, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And um, I appreciate your time. We'll be in touch with uh, both the slides, a link to the full um, report, as well as a recording of the video. And as always, any questions, please feel, reach out, feel free to reach out and drop me an email. Bye, everyone. Stay safe. And thank you again to our panel. And hello. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.